Good morning, church. It's good to see you here this morning. I'll invite you to take your Bible and go to 2 Peter, if you would. Today we're going to be looking at 2 Peter chapter 2, beginning with verse 4 down to the first part of verse 10. And you can kind of see it sort of bracketed there as the paragraph. I should recognize and note to you, uh, hopefully you know this, that uh, we sometimes have to encounter hard things in God's Word. So if you're here as our guest, um, our pattern is to work through books of the Bible, and so when we come to a text like this that addresses what this text addresses, uh, we must acknowledge that uh, this isn't arbitrary, but this is what it means to preach the whole counsel of God. We're starting with, with verse 4, uh, but we should note that the little word for at the beginning of our text links this text to the last phrase of verse 3 where we were last week well, the scripture says this speaking of the false prophets their condemnation from long ago is not idle or their condemnation has long been hand hanging over them their destruction is not asleep. Now our text. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. He did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness, with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world, the ungodly. If he, or if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. If he rescued righteous, so righteous Lot, greatly distressed, by the sensual conduct of the wicked. For as that righteous man lived among them, day after day he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. This is the word of the Lord. You know that the last verse of the song we just sang was the prayer of an anguished man. It was the prayer of a grieving father, Horatio Spafford, who had just lost his daughters. It was the prayer of a man who was longing to see things wrap up. Was a, was a desire to see the coming of the Lord, that the Lord would haste the day when our faith would be sight, and the clouds would be rolled back as a scroll. And whether you are consciously aware of it in this moment or not, the truth is we want this. And at points we want this very badly. And I reckon this, I'm talking to friends who have lived a week where this Desire may be particularly acute today. Desire to see our Lord bring righteousness to this world. Were we able to see the full sweep of God's glory, even for a moment, this would surely become our most repeated prayer, wouldn't it? If we could taste for a moment what it is like, this would probably be what we push out there in front of all of our other requests. Lord, haste the day. And our sight or our faith will be replaced with sight. We want this whether we are aware of it or not. 
you've never tasted really good banana pudding, you don't know to crave it. If you have never visited the seaside, then you don't know to ache for it. And though we've gotten hints of it throughout life, the fact that we have not seen the full measure of glory is probably the reason why we don't ache for it as we ought or pray for it as we would. But when we are seeing things clearly, we long for glory. And we are in a section here that is dealing with the promised return of Christ and all that was secured for us in the return of Christ. And you'll note here that, that Peter is advancing a very simple proposition. And that is, at Christ's coming, the people of God will be preserved. And there will be a reckoning for evil. Specifically, the evil of the false teachers. There is a longing to see all that has been broken and misshapen by sin... To be restored and set right. And it is that assurance that he is addressing here by bringing a hard word of correction. I think we're going to see as we work through this. In fact, you probably noted it even as we were reading it or if you read ahead uh, in preparation for today. The logic of the, of the text, Peter is just advancing one single argument. In fact, verses 4 down to verse 9 are one long sentence in Greek. And it's pushing one central thing. The logic is, if this happened, and if this happened, and if this happened, then you can be sure that this will happen. You acknowledge the conclusion going in, and there are two certainties that we see. So we'll go ahead and push that out at the beginning, verses 9 and 10. The, the conclusion of his logic, rightly seen, both are glorious. One is conciliatory. One is somber. What does he say in verses 9 and 10? God knows how to rescue the righteous and he will judge the wicked. And more particular to this context, he will judge those who through their se sensual self-interest distort the gospel. So those are the big things, the big arguments that he is pushing. God knows how to rescue the righteous from trials and he will judge the wicked. You remember that Peter is correcting a notion that judgment in general is a clever myth. We saw that back in chapter 1 verse 16. That is the, the thing he is seeking to set right, that the prospect of future judgment for evil is just a made up thing. It is a clever myth and he is seeking to correct that. You remember that the particular distortion that Peter is speaking to and confronting is a gospel that discounts the necessity of a changed life. So it doesn't really account for the need for repentance. If the gospel that you have heard discounts the need of turning away from sin and turning to Christ as Lord, that is a truncated gospel. And that is, it was alive in Peter's day, it is alive in our day, and it is the message that he is laboring to correct. That notion that we are receiving from him the gifts of grace without a turning to him in submission. Spe specifically, they're saying, look, I, we're, we're coming for all that you have to give away. If you've got something that's free, I'll take it. But I have no real interest in following you or obeying you or living in submission to you. And church, that is not the true gospel. That is not the message of the gospel. When they say there is no coming judgment, they're effectively opening the door to a kind of life that has no moral limits that is not constrained by the law of God, and that is not submissive to his real. It is, ex it is expressed in a kind of ungoverned freedom that says anything goes. If it feels good, do it. And this is definitional false teaching. It was in his day, it is in our day, 
It has been alive throughout our history. It is the suggestion, I'm sure you have heard it, that a loving God would never act in judgment. Now that's the suggestion. That is what is being promoted. And the argument of this text, Peter is saying, there's a whole lot of history that would suggest otherwise. To suggest that judgment is not real, you're going to have to look past a lot of biblical data to arrive at that conclusion. So his argument, the logic is, pushing forward three examples. In each case, you saw how he did this. He started with the word if. If this is true, and if this happened, and if this happened, then we can be sure God knows how to keep his people, rescue his people through trials, and he will judge false teachers. The logic of the text, if God consigned rebel angels to hell, and if he did not spare the wicked in Noah's day, and if he rained down fire and sulfur on the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities on the plain, then what do you think he will do to people who lead others away from the pure message of the gospel? We know that this is a mercy, rightly seen, this is a mercy. Matt prayed that we would preserve the purity of this message. Church, we have got to get this right. We have got to get this right. If we are presenting to the world, this is how a broken people are reconciled to an offended God. We have got to get this right. And that is why we see such sobriety and severity in these words. If he did not spare the angels, if he did not spare the wicked in Noah's day, and if he did not spare Sodom and Gomorrah, he will not spare those who lead the church astray. There is mercy in this, though it is a less discussed facet of God's goodness. Somehow you know it, everybody knows it. You could not worship, you could not adore, you could not sing to a wrathless God. You could not esteem or revere a God who was ambivalent toward evil. Somehow we must know that God is holy and just. You, you don't know the heart of a father until you understand both his tenderness toward his daughter and his severity toward the one who would do her harm. And I think the illustration holds. Not only God's tenderness toward his people, but his strong opposition toward those who would work harm to his people. Well, as I mentioned in my intro, we, we are conditioned against saying hard things. If, if it upsets someone, it's verboten. If, if it rattles people it must be avoided and if this is consistently applied then that means the wolves run free and the harm is expansive so we see in this the mercy of God and the protective impulse not only of the father but of Peter his servant in caring for the church you know I trust that it is an indicator of a culture that has jettisoned the whole notion of normative truth. That a teacher is commended not for accuracy, but by the number of ideologies that he or she can legitimize. And that's simply irresponsible teaching. That is definitional false teaching. If there is one path to freedom, it is not kindness for me to suggest to you that there are many. That's irresponsible and criminal. And that is in view why there is such this, a protective stance regarding the gospel. So, logic for our text. In these three examples, 
Severe judgment fell to the angels. Severe judgment fell to, I have to use this word, antediluvian. Uh, the, 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 uh, the sinners before the flood. And severe judgment fell to the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And that being the case, we must know that judgment is sure for those who distort the gospel. Three negative examples. I think he's building here a chronological case, all from the book of Genesis, and all of them to varying degrees related to deceit, defiance, and decadence. So you might think of it as exhibits in a courtroom. The first example, the disobedient angels. Look at it there with me in verse 4. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them into chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until judgment, if that is the case. Now, what is he talking about here? We're probably going to have some unanswered questions related to this. And I'm not even going to endeavor to answer all the, the possibilities that exist regarding the specific identity and the sins of these angels. Very few people suggest that this could be the rebellion that is alluded to in Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14. But I think the more probable example, and there's almost universal agreement among commentators on this, that this is that strange case we hear about in Genesis chapter 6, when the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were attractive and they took, this is coercive language, violent language, they took as their wives any whom they chose. Now you know this passage is notoriously difficult to interpret, but I think what is, seems apparent in this text is that these disobedient angels took human form. Now that happens across scripture, this is just another instance of that, you see several in God's word, where angelic beings took on human form. So this is the story, very unusual story, that is likely in view in Peter's teaching. You remember three angels visited Abram and Sarah in, in, a, in some kind of physical form. You may remember from Hebrews 13, just the suggestion that not to neglect hospitality, for some have entertained angels unaware. That they're one of the ways, at least for some time, that angels took form was in human, uh, I, I, perhaps in a, in a kind of possession type format. What is in view here is rebellion, lust, and likely violence. And the scripture is telling us here that these, those who acted with such um, impudence, were consigned to judgment. Our Lord said that there is a, this is Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. He warned of the eternal fire that was prepared for the devil and his angels. The point of this is, though this, there is an interpretive challenge associated with this, it doesn't have real bearing, I think, on Peter's larger point, which is that the uniform testimony of Scripture is that God judges sin. So we could wrestle with questions like, what are, who are the angels? What do they do? What are the chains? Are they kept in a place now? Is this a metaphorical statement? Is this something that is a, a physical reality? But whatever they did, they were punished for it. The Bible says they, they were cast into hell. In your ESV, you might see a note there. This is not the typical word for hell, but a word that is drawn from this mythology. It would be the, the underworld, that place where they go to await the actual full penalty. This is, this is meant they are, they are consigned to torment and likely carries the idea of restraint. Simply put, there were angels who asserted their independence from God and were judged for it. And Peter's saying, if they were not spared, then the false teachers are likewise in peril. The second example is the lawless in Noah's day. 
If they did not spare, or if he, God, did not spare, verse 5, the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald or a preacher of righteousness, with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. He's using a second example here of those who had set themselves in opposition to God. And it was universal. Those of you from a uh, long time, Basswood folks, remember our time in Genesis where he says also in chapter 6 that the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Those three words, only evil continually. If God is righteous and if he is good, he cannot be ambivalent when all he sees is only evil continually. In that troubling statement, the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and he grieved him to his heart. And the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heaven, for I am sorry that I made him. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the first occurrence of the word grace in the Bible. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Looking out at mankind who had set themselves completely in opposition. These opening chapters, how quickly after man's defiance of God's law at Eden, within just generations, things had grown so pervasively wicked that the only way that God could preserve the seed of the woman was to show grace to a man and his family and keep them alive through the flood. This story, I hope you know, is horrible. I know we like to decorate our nurseries this way with cute little pictures, but Genesis 6 through 8 is not the story of a happy floating zoo. This is a terrifying story of judgment. Church, this gives us an insight into the holy character of God. This helps us understand the God we sing to. This is a terrifying story of divine judgment. The most severe act of judgment in all of human history. For those unacquainted with your Bible, God showed mercy to a single man, Noah and his family. And though he preached repentance, it was completely spurned, and the entire population of the globe perished in a flood. This is not a cheery little story. This is a story of severe Judgment. Noah preaches. He, he's referred to as a herald or preacher of righteousness. And this is often the case. God's people would find themselves in the minority. He probably was fatigued all these years of appealing to the people of, uh, to, to turn to the Lord. Yet the Lord preserved him. And Peter is saying... God did not spare the, the angels. He did not spare Noah and, or the, uh, the evil in Noah's day. And thirdly, most, the lengthiest example is Sodom and Gomorrah. Deals with this at a little, little more length in verses 6 through 8. The scripture says, If by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he, God, condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. 
this story, even a reference, even a passing reference of the story of Sodom and Gomorrah is to make you a target culturally here in a way that is uh, sadly grievous. It is likely, this is probably where we're going to get the, the most significant pushback culturally as a church is when we, we draw clear biblical lines related to the specific sin in view in Sodom and Gomorrah. This is the area where in all probably, certainly in, in, our, in the last 10 years of our modern history, this is when the heat has been turned up most significantly. In fact, you, can, you, you see it everywhere. And the, the uniform testimony of Scripture is that God has outlined a biblical understanding, a clear biblical ethic related to how men relate to women and women relate to men. And the unpopular message of the gospel, yet it is plain, the unpopular message of Scripture that is so plain, is that God has a right to order what we do with our bodies sexually. Now that's what Scripture says. And the sin that is most prominent in Sodom and Gomorrah was the sin of homosexual practice. What we saw in Romans chapter 1, one men with men, women with women. And our passage tells us, you see something very similar in Jude, that this was meant to prefigure the eternal punishment that would be experienced in hell. If by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as this righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds, which he saw and heard. It's interesting that Peter makes such a point of identifying Lot as righteous. I, I suppose as you read that, like me, in fact, in some ways like Noah as well, both of them are presented to us whole, and both of them are presented uh, as conflicted figures. I mean, Lot, obviously we see his greed in choosing the well-watered plains of Sodom. We see him, his drunkenness. We see some really grievous acts across the course of his life. It seems that he communicated the sexual availability of his daughter. So there's not a lot here that we would commend as admirable. Yet our text says that this is a man who is righteous, we know that when he was warned, he fled the city. We know that God spared him in mercy. Yet we're given something else here in our text. That the, he was grieved by what he saw and by what he heard. His, his soul, the language is, was battered by it. What he saw and what he heard, he hated. And in this way, and there are, there's not a lot that we would push forward in Lot to see admirable and to be emulated. But when we see the law of God flaunted, it is right that our souls would be tormented by that. That we would be grieved by that. That we would be vexed by that. Douglas Moo on this text says, I wonder how many Christians are similarly distressed, and tormented by sin. Perhaps in seeking to excuse ourselves, we might respond that Lot was faced with a lot more sin than we, but I'm not sure that the differences are all that great. The Bible makes clear that the most serious sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was homosexuality. I hardly need to point out, says Moo, that homosexuality has, in the space of a few short years, become an accepted lifestyle in the United States. What is the reaction of Christians to the increasing abandonment of Christian moral norms? Many, to be sure, and to their credit, are responding, responding vigorously with a loving but firm restatement 
the biblical perspective on homosexuality, but many of us, I fear, are simply accepting what is happening without any undue fuss or concern. I'm going to say, if we, if we dial back our vigor on this topic, that puts us in peril of judgment because that is the very sin of the false teachers. We must be clear. If there is one path to freedom, and I say there is many, that is not a kindness, but a cruelty. So Peter is saying, if this happened with the angels, if this happened with the ancient evil in Noah's day, and if this happened in Lot's day, then this will surely happen. You accept this, you must accept this. Well, what is the, con- what is the conclusion? All of this ancient history is meant to say two things. Verse 9. The Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials. And he knows how to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. Again, the teachers in Peter's day and the teachers in our day would press us to believe that God will not judge the unrighteous. That that is the the message. And I think specifically, he extends it even beyond that to identify sexual sin. What is listed there is the lust of defiling passion and the rejection of authority. That is what these examples were meant to hold forward. The lust of defiling passion, the rejection of authority. The false teachers are to say, this is nothing to be concerned about. You don't have to fear the prospect of judgment. And I think Peter would have us believe if you're going to accept that prospect, then you have to look past a lot of biblical evidence to get there. If if you prefer the idea that that a God is incapable of wrath, it's probably best that you acknowledge it as just that. An idea that you find preferable. But you can't really call it God's idea. Not if scripture means anything. It is just your preferable notion. The idea you would rather hold about God. What is evident. That there are two categories of sin in view here. That were the fruit of these false teaching. One was sexual sin. This ungoverned, unchecked, open defiance. Of God's moral standard. And then the outright rejection of of authority. As I mentioned, I think the logic here is from the lesser to the greater. I I don't know that there's much gain in creating tears like we see in Dante's Nine Circles of Hell. But it does seem that Peter here is arguing if these things are true, then there is a greater concern from false teachers. If we think that the angelic rebellion is bad, if we think that the pre-flood lawlessness was bad, if we think the decadence of Sodom was bad, just think what will come of false teachers. The the sensuality, you know this, it, it has its own kind of harm. Rebellion does, theft does, deceit does. But false teaching is different in that it is a more frontal assault on the gospel. It is more directly an affront to the hope of a saving gospel. It obscures the way to Christ. And that is our message, and that is what we must keep right. That really is that, the, the whole thrust of this passage is we must preserve labor to protect from false teachers the purity of this message. That is our hope for all of us here. That is our hope for the community we live in. That is our hope for a world who has shifted on this topic in such a radical way. It is our hope for those who understand this struggle very well. 
And I know for some of us, we are describing something that is very real. It's not a cultural matter for you. It's very real and very personal. The hope of the gospel is this, and the message of the gospel is this. And I want you to know, you're in a room full of people. You are listening to a man who knows well the danger of destructive desire. The message of the gospel is there is hope for all sinners. We are far more alike than we are dissimilar. Though the particulars may vary, the experience of harmful desire is not foreign to any of us. That is why the gospel must be preserved. It is our only way home. But you must hear this. There is something to fear. There is something to fear. The suggestion, you're going to hear it, you're, it, it, it is going to be ubiquitous over the next weeks. Is the suggestion is you have nothing to fear. This is rather something to be embraced and celebrated. Our Lord said, do not fear those who could kill the body, cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both the body and the soul in hell. It's what we must not miss from this section of Scripture. It's that judgment is certain. And all who refuse repentance will face judgment. This distortion of the gospel, I think, will be particularly vivid this month. I think you're going to see this. It's going to be all over. There are those who will see men and women in bondage by their desire. And in, in religious language, we'll see, we'll, we'll see this happen in religious language. Their answer is to encourage them to feel pride in this. And there's no life there. There is no life there. It masquerades as a kind of tenderness, a kind of esteeming of personhood to say you should feel good about yourself. But to promote pride in this area is to nail shut the only door to freedom. To encourage pride here is to slam the door to any prospect that life could come. It is to nail that gut door shut. Scripture says that God holds at a distance the proud. The, all the proud. But he gives grace to the humble. And he does not delight in sacrifice, David said. Otherwise we'd give it. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. The only hope that any of us have, be it the rebellion exhibited by angels, be it the defiance of the sinners in Noah's day or the particular sin of Sodom, the only hope that any of us has is that God shows mercy. And everyone who has ever found refuge in Jesus has had to face the destructive effect of pride. Can I just hold before you, you know this passage, let me just read it to you again so you know it. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Don't kid yourself. Don't lie to yourself. Neither the sexually immoral nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Those who practice homosexuality will not inherit the kingdom of God. And neither will the greedy, and neither will the adulterer, and neither will the thief or the swindler or the drunkard. But Paul presses forward, doesn't he? 
and such were some of you. Such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. This was your story. This was my story. And the story of the gospel is that he knows how to rescue the righteous. The question then is how? How? As we wrap up, I want us to consider the positive side of Peter's two conclusions. God knows how to rescue the godly from trials. How does this happen? On this point, we might point to the two examples, two of the examples of, of three, where specific evidences of mercy are shown, both to flawed men who were shown the kindness of God, to Noah and to Lot. The truth is, the only reason that Noah was preserved is that he was, he was shown mercy. God, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This was not a better man than the other men. Whatever you understand of the gospel, it is not that he is out there looking for decent folks who will pay attention. The message of the gospel is that God saves sinners like us. Broken people like us. The beautiful story, how, how is it that he rescues us? Well, the story of Noah, I said, is one of the most severe stories in Scripture, but it is also a tender story in that it reveals to us the merciful heart of God. In Genesis chapter 9, after all of this severe judgment, God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I will make between me and you and every living creature that is with you. For all future generations, I will set my bow in the clouds. And it will be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. And when I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh and the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. I'm not going to do this again. Not like this. I'm not going to bring a flood again. When the bow is in the clouds, he says, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. How is it that he rescues the godly, because he promises to show mercy. I've never heard an explanation as to how the rainbow became associated with the homosexual community, but I can say that this is an emblem that was meant to communicate something dear to us. It was not meant to be co-opted. And it is not that we would wrap ourselves in pride, but that we would see and find rest in the covenant mercy of God. It is not a message that God's wrath would weaken or abate, but rather that it would be redirected. It is not that his wrath weakens or lifts, but rather that his wrath would be redirected away from us who earned it. That the bow of God's wrath would be drawn back into its cock position and aimed at heaven rather than at us. That's how God rescues the righteous. That he sets his judgment on the blameless Son of God so that offenders like us might be shown mercy. The bow of God's wrath drawn back in all of its severity to the cock position. Not leveled at us, but endured by Christ. We saw it in 1 Peter. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous 
for the unrighteous. That he might bring us to God. He suffered as a substitute for sinners. How does he reconcile an offended people? By substituting himself and absorbing our wrath. He was pierced for our transgressions, Isaiah says. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. That's the first example of the two that are given to us. The second we see in Genesis chapter 18, when Sodom is nearing judgment, and Abraham loves his nephew Lot, and he is appealing before God that they, be, they would be spared. He is interceding for, for Sodom. And in verse 25 of, 18, of, of chapter 18, Genesis 18, God says, far be it, speaking to God. Incidentally, I think this may be the, most protra- the first protracted prayer in, Bible, in the Bible, um, uh, interacting between God and man. Abraham says, far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to de- death with the wicked so that the righteous fare as the wicked, far be it from you, shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? It's a fair question, isn't it? Will you treat the righteous different than you treat the wicked? Won't the judge of all the earth do what is right? And so he appeals, would you show them mercy if I can find 50? If I can find in all of these cities, if I can find 50 righteous people, and God says, I will. 45, what about 40? What about 10 righteous people? And this barter or this this dickering back and forth between Abraham and, and God, a kind of protracted prayer, maybe the first in Scripture, but it's more than that. I think it is clear that this is an exploration of the character of God. And the question is this, is it possible that you would show mercy to the many based on the righteousness of the few? Do you see that? Will you show mercy to the many based on the righteousness of the few? And had Abraham continued his appeal, he would have eventually reached the basic expression of the gospel, which is this. Will you show mercy to the many based on the righteousness of the one? Would you show kindness to many if we could find one who is righteous? And the truth is he will and he has. And for that reason we hold before you the purity of the gospel and say if you will come to him in your sin he'll receive you. He has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. It is that message. It is that message that God bent the bow of his justice and aimed it heavenward. And that he clears the guilty based on the righteousness of the one. It is in that way that he rescues the righteous. There are many reasons to be tormented in our spirit by what we see, like Lot. There are reasons for our soul, our righteous soul, to be vexed when we see what we see. But it is not, church, that our team is losing. You look around, we're taking a beating on this this topic, you know that. I mean, culturally, if, if, if the measure is cultural inertia, we're losing on this topic. But that is not what we grieve. That is not why we are sorry. It is the impact on people and principally, in view of this text, a mishandled gospel. I've used the line from John Stark a lot, idols are slave traders 
disguised as abolitionists. You know what that means? Idol, idols are those who bring into bondage those that are, are disguised as if they are promoting freedom. If I ever come up with a better illustration, I'll use it. But I think maybe the saddest song I've ever heard Randy Newman's Sail Away, 1972. The lyrics are written from the perspective of a deceptive slave trader landing on the shores of Africa. And it reads, in America you'll get food to eat. You won't have to run through the jungle or scuff up your feet. You'll just sing about Jesus and drink wine all day. It's great to be an American. There ain't no lions or tigers, ain't no mamba steak, just the sweet watermelon, the buckwheat cake. And everybody's as happy as a man can be. Climb aboard, little wog. Sail away with me. Sail away. Sail away. We will cross the mighty ocean into Charleston Bay. Sail away. We will cross the mighty ocean into Charleston Bay. You know that our soul's enemy is bad about making promises that he can't keep. And it is the work of false prophets to propagate that deception. It's to promote freedom, to promote abolition, yet to bind and enslave. It is our responsibility and joy, church, to love the captive soul, but to rage against the captive. We love the captive soul. So what makes us grieve, what vexes our soul, is not that our tribe is losing, but because millions just keep boarding this slave ship called freedom. And much of the church is promoting it. Slavery and emancipation are not foreign concepts to any of us, is it? We know what it is to, free, to be in bondage. and We know what it is to be free. We know what the inside of a slave ship looks like. It doesn't have to be explained to us. We, we get slavery. Paul said, we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures. Passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us. Those three words. He saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy. Our only hope, your only hope in life that Jesus has freed us from our bondage. So the ongoing awareness of God's liberating work is what drives us to relate mercifully to those who remain in bondage. And that is how, why, how we account for the sobriety and the severity of this passage. And just suppose, just suppose we see a turning. Suppose we do. Assume our Christian posture toward them would be one that we would receive all who flee to Christ. Surely you know the Christian posture toward those in bondage is not mockery, it is not unkindness, it is not revulsion in the sense of personal disdain. It would be a cruel distortion to suggest that condemnation is not real. It is a cruelty to say to those in bondage you should feel pride. But it is likewise a cruel omission to suggest that there is no way home for you. There is. If we are gospel people, we know that there is a way home, for we have been shown the way home. That is, in fact, our message. The church's mission has never been to make America behave. Our message is for people who tried to behave but couldn't. And our message is that Jesus frees sinners, all kinds of sinners. 
So imagine a time that when the dust settled, we see a turning. Suppose some of those we love who are still in bondage and are slaves. Suppose they were to come to their senses. What if those who were lied to woke up in Charleston Bay, horrified at their own deception? And what if they turn to the church for help? What are we going to do when they show up breaking, holding their broken cisterns? Where they tried to satisfy and it didn't satisfy. What are we going to do when they show up with their broken cistern? Here's what. We will weep for joy. And we will throw open our once shackled arms. And we will cover their shame. And we will hold before them the merciful Savior. And we will remember our own rescue. And we won't even think of saying we told you so. We will lead them to the cross. And we'll find the biggest cow we can find and we will grill out. Like a happy father. Welcoming home a son. And we will say bold things about the expansiveness of grace. And together we will celebrate our rescue. So I ask you, church, knowing the severity of this, do you prize, do you prize, do you treasure, do you guard as sacred the authentic gospel that's given to us in Scripture? And is your righteous soul distressed and tormented by the lawless deeds that you see and hear? Final point of application. Have you considered the reality of condemnation? Have you? The assumption is everyone here I'm speaking to needs help. The message of the gospel is if you will come to him, he will receive you. And in Christ, we have an ark of safety. Go there. And to flee from Sodom is not to enter the wilderness, but it is to find a home in Jesus. And he will never turn you away. So come. If you tarry till you're better, you will never come at all. Just come. He will receive you. Father, we believe that. It's the message that saved us. It's the message that will save our friends. It's the message that will save our children. It's the message that will save our grandchildren. It's what our city needs. It's what our nation needs. So, Lord, would you give us grace to hold dear and prize as precious the simple message of the gospel. Father, I pray that we would be free and and generous and promiscuous with this message, that we we would speak it often, that the lavish promises of the gospel would be seen in their glory. That your people would be welcome. Lord, we pray too that you would haste the day. And our faith is made sight, the clouds are rolled back. Lord, we pray that until that day we would be faithful. We pray in Christ's name.